much. If you have your Bible, I'm just going to warn you, we're going to be all over the place today. Because the last several weeks, we've been, we've been tackling some pretty heavy topics. The idea of sin, the idea of atonement, the idea of redemption. And, and those are all pretty, pretty heavy things. A lot of times you don't see sin spoke about in church a lot, which is crazy. Um, uh, and, and it's so funny, Andy Griffith. How many of you Andy Griffith fans in the house? Yeah. How many have no idea who Andy Griffith is in the house? Raise your hand. It's okay. All right. It's all right. I knew there'd be some. Um, that's that, hey, listen, people laugh about that. There are churches around the world begging for the diversity that we have at Real Life Church. The difference in ages and people that come together to worship the king. We may know different music or different shows, but I sure love what we got. But uh, Andy Griffith was talking to Barney one day, and Barney was talking about being at church. And Andy asked him, he said, well, Barney, what do they preach about? And he said, sin. He said, well, what about sin? And Barney thought for a minute, he said, I think they're against it. (laughs) And as funny as that is, and that was written years and years ago, culturally, it's getting more and more common to not bring up the topic of sin because we are afraid to offend people. And the reality is the Bible says the cross is an offense. It's, It's going to come right in the face of the things that you find acceptable because of our sin nature. So to tackle that topic was a big topic. And then Pastor Aaron to go into atonement and talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. And that shed perfect blood is what covered my sin that I had and the sins that I'm going to commit tomorrow. It is that powerful of a blood. It was that powerful of a sacrifice of atonement. What a beautiful thing. And then last week I got to preach on redemption. I got to tell you to give God the rope, which I appreciate the comments on that, that that stuck with some people, that uh, that. That's how they had treated God, was just tied him to a rope and pulled him close when they needed him. And and so I appreciate that. But today I'm going to talk about, I think in the scripture what you have is in scripture you have these earthly or these heavenly actions that take place. Heavenly actions that take place. Um, uh, the, 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 The conception of Jesus and Mary, that was a heavenly action that took place. The the parting of the Red Sea, that was a a heaven that we just sang about. That that was a heavenly action that took took place. Atonement, a heavenly action that we had nothing to do with. We, We could not have atoned if we wanted to. It was a heavenly action that took place. Redemption in and of itself, to be purchased for a purpose, is a heavenly action. But with all heavenly reactions, everywhere in Scripture we see that a heavenly reaction, there is something that is required to follow, and that is an earthly response. We are required to respond, or we will respond, to any heavenly action that occurs. Um, How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? How many of you looked at that and were like, oh my goodness, and it just kind of blew your mind? Or how many of you looked at it and went, that's a big hole in the dirt. <laughs> Both people exist, and I'm not, I'm not faulting either one. It takes a lot, Jennifer and I, it takes a lot. We've, we've, we've been able to travel, we've been, and, and it takes a lot. I love, I love mountains and scenery and water and beaches and all that stuff. I love it. I love sunsets. I, I love all of it, okay? And Jennifer also loves it. We've seen a lot of great things, but we were on our vacation two weeks ago when we were on vacation, we rolled up at a sunset over on the Pacific. We were in California, and we rolled up on a sunset that was between these two mountains that had kind of jutted out into the water, and the sunset's right in between them. And the sky literally turned about 50 different colors. And over the next 30 minutes, it continued to change colors. And, and I saw Jennifer and myself, we were sitting there, and we, we couldn't say anything. It was just one of those moments where I was in complete awe of what, what God had put before me. Have any of you ever been there in that moment? Maybe it wasn't in the scenery. Maybe it was when your child was born and you don't know what to say. There's nothing good to say. Okay. I, I was that way through the whole childbirth process. My part was relatively easy in the childbirth process. 
And I can remember one of the things we joke about, Jennifer and I joke about is when, when, like I smiled the whole time, like I'm just grinning ear to ear. And when Vanessa was born, it was still in the camcorder days. This was before everybody had cell phone. So I had my little can, my little Sony camcorder and, and I'm filming and I'm just grinning ear to ear. And Jennifer's about, about to the point where the doctor's like, all right, I'm going to need you to bear down. Ladies, how many of you know that moment I'm talking about? This is post contractions. We're beyond contractions now and we're getting about to get down to it. And Jennifer looked at me as calm as she possibly could in that moment. And she said, I need you to quit smiling. (laughs) And I didn't know what to do. Brandon, you're a smiley guy. You know what I'm talking about, right? Because you're so overwhelmed and, and, and him and Shauna just had Walker and, and he's holding him now. And like, I didn't know what to do, but smile. I'm only camp- I'm not videoing anything because I'm just grinning the whole time. I'm like, got shot to the window and everything else. And she's like, you got to quit smiling. And I'm like, I'm trying to not smile. <laughs> this is not working. As I was in awe of the moment. It was a heavenly action, miracle of life. It's a heavenly action, the sunset that I could not explain, nor could anyone paint, because about the time they would put their paint in the color, it had already changed. And I was just in awe. Jennifer kept saying, I just can't, I can't describe it. And I said, I know. He's indescribable what he does. The only true reaction or response to a heavenly action is worship. Is worship. It ought to be as easy as when you have your reflexes checked and there is a specific point on a ligament or whatever it is that gets hit and you can't help it, but your leg flops. I don't even know what I'm talking about. There, it ought to be that, that natural, that instinctive, that when God does this, we do that. When God responds or acts in heaven, we respond in worship. But we don't. And so today I, I want to really kind of lean into this idea of worship. And, and before you think it's just about what we just got finished with, no, that's a, that's a title that we've placed on a portion of our service. Is the worship portion of our service. And, and in that definition, we simply may mean the music portion of it. But, but we worshiped in, in baptism a moment ago. Here at the end of service, we're going to worship in communion together as a body. And we're going to worship now by opening the word of God. And we worshiped by lifting praise and song to him. And you worshiped by getting in the car this morning or or kneeling by your bedside last night. Or or worship is not something that we can, you or I have this really, this ability to put in a box. And that really frustrates most of us because we, we tend to like things in the box they go in. We, we tend to like things that we can define or, or, we, or we can kind of go, oh, I have an understanding of this. But really, it's different for each person. And so there's a quote by John Stott, and it says this, true worship is the highest and the noblest activity of which man, by the grace of God, is capable. It's the thing we were created to do. There's a story of a man in India, and he was walking through the market in India, and at the end of the market, there were six bright white washing machines at the end of the market. High-end, nice washing machines. And when he got down there, he was a little bit surprised because he didn't know if the gentleman was doing laundry or what was going on. But he walks down there, and the, the lids were all open on the washing machines, and in the washing machine is this brown liquid. And thinking, man, somebody's clothes were really dirty. The reality came out, and what the reality was, was that the gentleman was making tea in the washing machine tanks, because he could make a lot of it and sell it in the market. And so he was agitating the tea. How frustrating is that? Because you know, and I know, that is not the purpose or intent of a washing machine. It's not what it's for. And I just want to challenge you and say, just as silly as that sounds, is also sometimes where you and I get as humans whose sole purpose in creation was to worship the creator. And sometimes we act like washing machines twisting tea around. 
I think from heaven, he looks down at times and goes, what are you, what are you doing? This is, not, this is not what I created you for. This is not what you were intended, your intended purpose is. That's not what I had in mind. And so we got to walk through some principles and this idea of worship. And, and the first one being simply this is that we were designed to worship. And so, and, and, and when we try to figure out what the purpose for anything is, we said last night or last week that we were redeemed to a purpose. We have to ask, what is it for? What, what am I for? God, why did you, if you redeemed me for a purpose, what is that purpose? All of you, if you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, if you have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, your number one purpose is to worship God. It's to worship Christ and him alone. Make sure you hear that last part. Him alone. There's nothing that gets equal billing. Yeah, but Pastor Vince, I, I love my spouse. Awesome. They don't get equal billing. I love my kids. Great. I love mine too. They're pretty awesome. But they don't get equal billing. I love my kids. I don't worship my kids. The term worship has a couple of different definitions. One of them is to, to find value. And let me give you this. It's simply defined as this worship. We'll throw it up on the screen is intentionally giving worth or value through our words and or actions. It is worth ship. If you look at the Hebrew word, it actually means to bow down. To bow down. This is something that that's the only response that you have is before God to bow down. We see this in the book of Revelation when John is on the island of Patmos and he gets this revelation from God, this vision from God of what's to come. And it says that he stands there and he hears a voice. And when he hears a voice, he falls to the ground as if he were a dead man. It knocks him out. Another scripture that we're very familiar with is that on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, right? How many of you have heard that passage? How many of you have always assumed that's because it's God and we're going to, out of respect, bow the knee? No. The translation is on that day, every knee will buckle. You won't be able to stop yourself from bowing before God when he shows up. That's, that's the worth, that's the, the stature that God is to be seen in. And so as much as I, my wife loves me, I don't want her to worship me, that would be weird. How many of you think that would be weird? Just making sure you're still with me. Somebody was kind of like, well, no, it'd be weird. As much as I love my kids, I will not worship them. And I don't want them to worship me. I'm pretty flawed. I have some stuff that I'm still working out between God and I, and I, I cannot be, I cannot be the thing that they are looking to. Yes, I, I don't mind being an example. Yes, I don't mind role model or, or whatever we want to say, but that comes with a caveat that I'm, I'm going to drop the ball. God does not. He is worth our relationship, our devotion. He is worth our worship. And so we're designed to worship. And if we're designed to worship, it means we have to really look at, are we living out our purpose in worship? Do I worship God in the way that, is the way that it needs to be? Revelation says this, that God is the most valuable thing. Revelation chapter 15, verse four, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you. What is the next word church alone are holy and all nations will come and worship you. Does it say all nations should come and worship you? Will. It's going to happen. The choice you and I are making is not whether God will be worshipped. It's whether you're going to do it now, voluntarily, or one day when you'll bow before him with no option. See, that sounds oppressive. Oh, no. If you don't choose now, you get to live out your choice. So there's still grace in the choice. They'll come and worship for your righteous act. Why would we worship God? Because his righteous acts have been revealed. The goodness of God has been revealed. That's why we worship him. 
It's not that he's all powerful, all present, all knowing, all stars in place. All No, it's because of what he has shown to do. God said, I don't want you to worship me simply because of my station. I want you to worship me because of the love I've poured out for you. The righteous acts that I've done, the, the, the cross, the resurrection, the grace in your life, those righteous acts that I've done, that's why all nations will come to worship him. And so we see that we're designed for this, but it's been misdirected. Our worship's been misdirected. And this, tell me if this doesn't sound like our culture, that we've exchanged the glory of the immortal God and we worship the creature rather than the creator. Man, we live here. How many of you worship something else during your lifetime? <laughs> you don't even know then. I worshiped. I've worshipped a lot of things, I, I'm primarily myself. I'm, I'm, I am my favorite God. Will anyone else say amen to that? You, you may not want to, but that's just the reality of it. I am my favorite God. Bob, I like me. In fact, I would say I love me. I love me. You love you too. And so we, we struggle with, with replacing God with, with our thing. Whether that, and people place ourselves up there. We place selfishness up there. We place hobby up there. We place spouses, kids, family, job, career. How many people know of people that have just destroyed themselves because they won't, they won't do anything but their career because this is what's going to identify them? And we've seen this throughout history, and our worship has been misdirected. The things that God gave us to give us joy... We immediately have placed it at the top of the list and so they no longer give us joy. In fact, when you move it to the worship seat, it begins to suck the life out of us. Strange how that works. When something isn't where it's supposed to go, it doesn't work. It's the whole round peg square hole. And when we move things to the place of worship, when we move things to the place of where God should be, then problems begin to occur. And so we've misdirected our worship. We've seen our culture get misdirected in this, where we go, well, I don't know about this God thing. I hear this, I'm hearing this more and more. And, and you're seeing more and more Christians in what it's called deconstruction. Deconstruction is the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask so many questions that I can't figure out the answer. And since I, as my own God, can't figure out the answer it must mean that there's not a God, and so I will deconstruct my faith in him. The whole idea of deconstruction is idol worship. It's you above. Your thoughts, your ideas, your knowledge, your wisdom is the paramount thing on the universe. How many of you know we are not the paramount of knowledge in the universe? <laughs> uh, I've seen some things they sell on Amazon to know that humankind has issues. You can legitimately buy sunglasses with windshield wipers on them on Amazon. I know some of you are like, really? And those were made for you. Okay. If you're saying that, All right. I'm, there's no way there's been too many moments in my life where I've done the opposite thing of what should have been done out of either emotion, stress, Pride, selfishness, I cannot be, I cannot be the, the thing of worship. It doesn't work, I'm going to fail. And yet God doesn't. But our culture, our society, we as people have moved and we've taken the creation and made it the thing and the creator we've set aside with a rope tied to him that when it gets really bad, we can bring him in. And so if we've been misdirected, how do we get back, how do we get back on path? There's scripture that kind of leads us to this, but we don't all the time like the scripture that leads us to this. Because the thing is, our culture is appreciative of, of this wide idea of life, this broad idea of life. But Jesus tells us really quickly, in order to redirect, if we've been misdirected, there comes a redirect that needs to happen. And Jesus gives us that in the book of John, chapter 4. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Spirit and truth. We're going to flip that. We're going to go truth first. Truth 
is narrow. How many of you know that? If you don't, let me inform you. Truth is narrow. There are not millions of truths. There is a truth. There are things that we want to add truth to, but ultimately when we come to the idea of God, when we come to the idea of following God, the Bible says straight is the way and narrow is the gate. Now you can choose the broad path, but it doesn't lead you anywhere that you wanna go. We see this when God gives instruction and our tendency is to kind of widen that instruction to make it mean more than what we think it ought to mean, it becomes easier for us. That, that's the goal. We want to make it easier for us to live by rather than, making it, but rather than living in this narrow path, which actually would draw us to holiness, is what we've been talking about the last month. The truth is narrow. And, you, and if you miss, listen, if you miss truth, it's bad. How many of you have ever thought someone was pregnant and then said it to them? Guess what? The truth of someone being pregnant is not bad, right? That's not bad unless it's ultimately not true. Then a very nice statement becomes a very offensive statement that passed. Am I right? If I walked up to you as a bald man, because I can, I can appreciate a beautiful head, okay? And you or Sean and I walked up and I said, guys, man, hair is looking great today. Both of you would look at me going, he's either being sarcastic or he's just being a jerk. Right? Because to someone with hair, hair is looking great, maybe great. To somebody without any hair, it's just not a truth. And so when we, when we start to try to wrap our mind around what truth is, you have to think through the idea of truth. We believe in our Christian faith that there is but one God and his name is Jesus Christ. That is who we worship and is the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three in one. You, Pastor Vince, I don't understand that. Welcome to the party. If God was a God I understood, I would trade seats with him. And so I have to be able to come narrow to the truth and go, wait, here's the truth of my life. That if I do things that are outside the will of God, then there are going to be consequences because those things are called sin. And so I have to worship knowing that there is truth. In fact, the truth is what allows me to worship properly. Because see, if I'm confused on who God is, then the rest is going to get real squirrely what I worship is going to get real interesting. But if I'm locked into who God is, then my worship becomes truthful. The idea of worship or truth being narrow and our direction or our target of our worship is a critical piece to our faith. We worship one thing, one when we come in service in the morning, I'm glad you're here. But I am, worship, I am preaching to you, but through preaching, I am worshiping to an audience of one. This worship team here, I hope they lead you in worship. That's their role, is to lead the body in worship. Why? So that one gets glorified. Not each individual person here, that's not their role. Their role is to lead you to glorify him. That's what they do. And so as long as our worship is narrow, focus on the one, we're going to be okay. And then here's what throws churches. Here's what rattles us. Is that although the truth is narrow, worship, worship is broad. And it's not bound let me just real quick survey. How many, how many Baptists in the house? Put them way up. It's okay. You're not going to be Pentecostal if you raise your hand higher. Okay. How many Pentecostals in the house? Former Pentecostals, Pentecostals. Okay. How many of you come from Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran background? Put them up. All right. 
How many of you have no church background? You walked into real life and this was it, baby. That's what I figured. Most of us, especially in this area, culture-wise, we know we're supposed to go to church. So we have an idea that the truth is narrow. But then why churches fight all the time has nothing to do with the truth. It has everything to do with worship being bound into certain styles or preferences or whatever. So the Bible doesn't really get into it. Man, you see, you see David dancing naked before the Lord. We're not doing that here. In that one instance, we are bound, okay? We're bound. Keep it bound, all right? But you see hands lifted. You see mouths open. You see people just in awe of God in the moments that God gives them. There are only really two things that we see God, Jesus, while here, ordain as worship. Really only two. You all just got to experience one. You got to be a part of a Jesus Christ ordained form of worship this morning. What a beautiful thing. Here in just a few minutes, we're going to be involved in the second one. We're in that upper room. Jesus said, when you do this, as often as you do this, remember me. I I want you to keep this one, in other words. I want you to keep baptism as an outward expression of an inward decision. I want you to keep communion as this, this representation of what I did for you, this body and blood, this sacrifice. I want you to keep it because it's important, it's valuable. And if Jesus says we keep it, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna keep it. But in regards to how you get there, some of you worship in the stillness of a moment. Some of you love the drums kicking in on, you you are a God of power. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. And you love that part of the song. I love that part of the song. How we get there is different. And and you have to do it. It is the earthly response to a heavenly action. How are you responding to the heavenly actions, the heavenly work, that God has done in your life.